the 1st of September, 1939. Germany invades Poland, and the Nazi regime employs propaganda to impress upon German civilians and soldiers that the Jews are not only subhuman creatures, but also dangerous enemies of the German Reich. The regime aims to elicit support for their policies aimed at removing Jews permanently from areas of German settlement. After the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, particularly after the catastrophic German defeat at Stalingrad in February 1943, Nazi propaganda, to further incite hate and foster a climate of indifference to the faith of the Jews, stresses themes linking Soviet communism to European Jewry, presenting Germany as the defender of Western culture against the Judeo-Bolshevik threat, and painting an apocalyptic picture of what would happen if the Soviets won the war. To prevent this, not only the SS and soldiers, but also German civilians participate in persecution and mass murder of Jews in Europe. One such civilian is Erna Petri. Erna Petri, the daughter of a farmer, was born as Erna Kerbs on the 30th of May 1920 in Harrison, then part of the Weimar Republic, which was the name given to the German government from 1918 to 1933. In 1936, the 16-year-old Erna met Horst Petri, and despite her father's objections, they quickly began a relationship. A year later, Erna became pregnant, and the two got married in 1938. The child was a boy, and several years later they had one more child, a daughter, who was born in January 1943. The Second World War began on the 1st of September 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. After Poland's defeat in early October 1939, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union divided the country in accordance with a secret protocol to the German-Soviet non-aggression pact. Poland was split into thirds, the western third annexed to Germany, the eastern third annexed to the Soviet Union, and the middle third turned into a semi-independent administrative unit called the General Government. In 1941, Horst Petri was conscripted to the Waffen-SS, which was the military branch of the SS. Shortly after the German army conquered Galicia, located in the southeastern part of the general government, the civil administration assigned 21 agricultural estates to the SS. The SS estates were to be the first step towards the Germanization of the general government, which was to be implemented over a period of 15 to 20 years. The aim of Germanization was to eradicate the linguistic, cultural, and ethnic diversity of local populations, reinforcing German dominance and hegemony. The tasks of the SA estate administrators included supplying the military and occupation administration in the district, delivering food to the Reich, securing the agricultural production of the surrounding villages, and collecting the contingents. If these were not fulfilled, or only insufficiently fulfilled, then the SS farmers had the authority to enforce severe punitive actions against entire villages. Anna's husband Horst came to the SS estate Lipica Dolna in German-occupied Poland in the summer of 1941 as an employee. In the following summer of 1942, he took over the SS estate Gzenda, today's Ukrainian Hirada, once the grand manor house of a Polish noble, located in the region of Galicia, as the manager of the farm. Anna, who had continued to live in Germany with her three-year-old son, moved with him into the Gzenda manor house. Horst became advisor for 18 other SS estates in the districts of Galicia and Kraków. Within two days of moving, Anna witnessed her husband beating a laborer. Horst was also a sexual deviant who would routinely rape his female servants. Local farmers called him a sadist who enjoyed whipping Ukrainians, Poles and Jews. On one occasion, he killed four Jews who had been caught on the estate and who had escaped from a train headed to a gassing center near Lublin. Moreover, Horst participated in mass deportations, the massacre of local farmers, and the bombing of a Ukrainian village with grenade launchers. Anna followed her husband's lead and abused her farm workers. She often fired warning shots at them, sometimes as her son watched. On one occasion, Anna had her husband send three Ukrainian peasant women to Yanovska concentration camp after they refused to work. To her surprise, all three women were spared death, and she even allowed them back to the manor several weeks later. Anna also accompanied her husband on hunts for fugitive Jews, during which he personally killed four Jewish men. 
After the harvest in autumn 1942, the approximately 150 Jews from Gajenda were also transported to the Yanovska concentration camp or the Belzhets extermination camp. In September 1943, Anna was returning from a shopping trip in Lviv in her carriage when she came across six nearly naked boys, aged 6 to 12, crouching by the side of the road. The children had escaped from a rail car destined for Sobibor extermination camp, and they were terrified and hungry. When Anna realized they were Jewish escapees, she calmed them, took them home, and gained their trust by bringing them food from her kitchen. She understood very well that all Jews who were roaming the countryside were supposed to be captured and shot. Horst was not at home at the time, so she waited, but because he did not return after several hours, she decided to shoot the six children herself. Anna took the children into the woods to a pit, where other Jews had been buried. She brought a pistol with her, one that her father had kept from World War I, and given to her as a parting gift as she left for Ukraine. As she was lining the children up, she knew exactly what she was going to do. She had learned from Horst that the most effective way to kill was a single shot to the back of the neck. After Anna had killed the first two, the others began to cry quietly and whimper. None of the children fled since they were exhausted after being on a rail car for several days. In the end, she killed the rest of them, one by one, execution style. In 1944, the Petris fled their manor due to the advance of the Red Army, and Horst got his SS tattoo removed to destroy evidence. He was then taken prisoner by US soldiers, but was released in May 1945. Horst and Anna both avoided detection during the initial search for war criminals in the post-war period. They settled down in East Germany and became farmers. In 1957, their son fled the country, drawing the attention of the Stasi, the East German secret police, which started surveilling them. They were arrested for anti-state activities in 1961. While searching through their house, Stasi officers found no evidence of the couple plotting against the state. However, they happened to come across photos of the Gzenda Manor and a guestbook from the war which contained the names of numerous senior SS and German army officers. Both Petris were interrogated for months, and Horst was the first one to confess. Anna initially denied everything, but in the end, she gave in and confessed after about a month of questioning. Asked why she did not talk sooner, she said she feared punishment, but thought her husband would take the blame for her crimes. Anna told the officers that she had learned how best to kill someone while overhearing her husband's colleagues discussing the mass shooting of Jews. When asked why she shot the Jewish men and children, she replied that she was barely 25 years old, still young and inexperienced. Moreover, because she lived only under her husband, she rarely encountered other women, became hardened, desensitized, and wanted to show the SS men that she, as a woman, could conduct herself like a man. When asked how she, as a mother of two children, could shoot innocent Jewish children, her excuse was that she was conditioned to fascism and racial laws, and was told by others that she had to destroy the Jews. After the evidence was examined, the local prosecutor charged both Petris with numerous offences, including war crimes and crimes against humanity. In September 1962, both Horst and Anna went on trial in Erfurt, where 17 witnesses, mostly former workers from the manor, testified against them. The evidence showed that Horst had abused and murdered people on his own initiative, without direct orders. In September 1962, Horst was sentenced to death and on the 22nd of December the same year, he was guillotined at Leipzig prison. Unlike her husband, Anna was not executed for her crimes, but on the 15th of September 1962, sentenced to life in prison. Caught off guard by the severity of the sentencing, she retracted her statements and started to fight her case. Her friends and family reassured her that she could quickly get out of prison. However, Anna's pleas for release and those of her children on her behalf were routinely ignored by East German officials. In letters to her attorneys, Anna wrote that the court interpreter had mistranslated the words of the foreign witnesses who testified against her, resulting in her being falsely implicated. She wrote long letters to the prosecutor's office attempting to explain herself. In a 1963 appeal, Anna insisted that she had never killed anyone nor handled a gun. Only out of love and fear had she falsely confessed to murdering the children, hoping to help her husband. Anna then said that she had heard about the Jews who had been deported to Lublin to be gassed and protested. She claimed to have told her husband that those people are humans after all, 
only to be silenced by him, who told her to be quiet or she would get in trouble. However, all these claims were rejected. Anna was getting desperate and started to claim that in 1938, around the time of the Kristallnacht pogrom, she had protested the treatment of the Jews and that only her pregnancy had kept her from being immediately arrested. She even accused the Stasi of forcing her into confessing to the murders with a note from Horst. The note, which he said was a forgery, implicated her in the murders of the children. Anna said she was angry about the note since she was innocent, but had concluded that it was a plea for help from Horst. Anna said she had chosen to take some of the blame for his sake. When the Berlin Wall fell in November 1989, Anna, now nearly 70, was still in prison. In December 1989, she wrote to her West German attorneys to re-examine her case, and in 1992, she was released for health reasons. It was allegedly Stille Hilfe, a relief organization for arrested, condemned and fugitive SS members, who convinced the court to release her. She then went on trips to the Alps with Gudrun Berwitz, the daughter of Heinrich Himmler and a prominent member of Stille Hilfe. Anna once referred to Berwitz as the most wonderful woman. When Anna Petri died in July 2000, she was 80 years old. Although Anna murdered innocent people, her funeral was attended by hundreds of people, many of whom believed that she had served her sentence in prison unjustly. The children of the Petris never retracted their support for their mother. In an interview in 2006, Anna's daughter, who was 18 when her mother was arrested, said her parents had often showed the photo albums of the Gajanda Manor to her and special guests. There were no tears shed for Anna Petri. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.